Hello. Very difficult to say something new after we've heard already so much. We tried to coordinate our um, presentations a little. I don't know how well that worked. My idea is to go into a few specific things and then also to wrap up because sometimes I have the feeling there are so many trees and we don't uh, see what is important. Um, I will talk a little bit about uh, the jet engine, aircraft systems, and uh, go even uh, into the issue of metal going with the oil into the human body. I have an introduction to set the scene, and then I summarize the arguments. First of all, um, we need to uh, look at various definitions. Fume event, smell event is what we frequently say, and we already heard uh, you should combine this fume and smell event essentially is the same. Um, and I think with these definitions that come from practice because people saw something or they smelled something, that's good, but we need to move on. And my proposed definition is cabin air contamination event, call it cake. Also EASA in their documents are calling cabin air contamination, CAC, and then event. So it is not something which is totally um, um, taken out from something. So in an air contamination event, cake, the air in the cabin and or cockpit of an aircraft is contaminated. Sensation of the contamination can be from vision, fume or smoke, from olfaction, smell or odor, a combination of typical symptoms experienced by several passengers and or crew, or by related measurements of CO, CO2, ozone, or other harmful and hazardous concentration of gases and vapors. And I've taken the last bit from the CS25. Now, the difficulty when we talk about odor is um, that all kinds of things can have an odor, as we've heard also from TAP. And we need to concentrate on what really matters, and then we can discard a couple of things and go right to uh, what matters here. Um, also to set the scene, um, I picked one of the flights we've seen recently, um, 20 2nd of August, Hawaiian Airlines, A321neo, emergency landing and evacuation, smoke on board, and um, this is from um, the uh, internet where you find uh, these pictures, and uh, it was very well reported. Um, so pilots received a fire warning from the cargo compartment and declared an in-flight emergency. Then 20 minutes later they landed. After landing there was no visible evidence of fire, no visible flames. Uh, and then we have since determined that the seal failed in the aircraft's left engine. Now when you go to um, Flight Radar 24, you see that it was top of descent when the thrust lever was uh, pulled back. Uh, that smoke filled the cabin. So that was something uh, unusual which happened there, but that was the consequence. Uh, the pilots um, then uh, discovered the fire alarm from the cargo compartment. Um, there's the smoke sensor, and they thought there's a fire in the compartment. But clearly it was not, because we know that the air goes from the cabin into the cargo compartment, and this is why the cargo compartment uh, smoke sensors uh, um, were triggering this alarm. The, the pilots accelerated a little bit their descent and came down, um, and uh, passenger left the airplane with slides. Now, half of the time from the descent, they were uh, flying after 10,000 feet, and they could have opened the ram air uh, to get fresh air in, because what we see from this constant uh, level of smoke that uh, there was still um, contamination uh, going on. And uh, so if they would have uh, used that, uh, they could have uh, kind of halved uh, the effect uh, during the second part of the descent. But it's not in the checklist, 
and the pilots were praised. They did a good job. They followed the checklist and everything was fine. But the message is industry needs to change the checklist and uh, consider the fume events. Jet engine technology, you know, we've seen that uh, there are the bearings. And if you take uh, this engineering drawing, you see the, the yellow spots here where we have the bearings. And uh, here in the compressor stage, the air is uh, tapped off. Now, if these uh, bearings leak, then there's a chance that it goes into the bleed air. If these uh, bearings leak, uh, then it goes uh, out the engine. So we have to see how many bearings are in front of where we tap off and how many of the bearings are behind. Now, we've seen that picture, and I'll go a little bit more into detail. Um, well, Susan uh, said the air needs to go uh, in through the seals in order to prevent the oil from going out. And we see here in the so-called dry cavity, there's an oil drain, uh, a drain, uh, but it's not water, it's, it's oil. So we, we know that we have an air and oil mixture here, whereas we have an oil and air mixture here. Now, there is this double sealing, and if the air is pressing in here, the air is also pressing out there, and there we see that air and oil are going out, and this is why we have uh, the normal leakage. And uh, here you see uh, the oil system. Here's the engine, here are the oil sums with bearings, and the oil is pumped into the bearings uh, coming out here, and it is uh, going to a deaerator and then uh, back into the oil tank. Now, because we are pressing all the time um, uh, air into the oil, the air also needs to go out uh, from the oil, otherwise uh, you will have a compressed system. Um, and, um, well, there are some quotes from Exxon uh, where they kind of admit that all this happens. Um, now, how does the air get out with a deaerator? It is such that we have such a cylinder, and along at the side, um, the air and oil mixture enters. Um, it swirls around through centrifugal forces. Uh, the oil is um, guided to the side and is going uh, down here and back into the fuel tank where um, the air is going out. Now, this deaerator only has a certain efficiency, which means that clearly some of the air going out will also have oil going with it. And this is the oil consumption. So when people say, we've heard that, um, the engines consume um, half a liter per hour per engine, uh, and then the question is, where does the oil go? Uh, and then what do we think is all going into the cabin? But if that would all go into the cabin, we would need buckets to carry the oil out. So that's not the case. So most of the oil is going out here and very, very little is uh, leaving th through the seals. And how much? That depends on a small portion, let's call it X. And X is something in the order of 1%. I mean, bad enough. Yeah? And it can be calculated. And then we see that we find the concentrations of hydrocarbons as they are also measured in the EASA studies. So that's normal operation, obviously. There can be failures, something is broken, and then we have all the fume in the cabin. But another issue is that engines uh, stay longer on the wing uh, without any uh, seal replacement. And here, with the CFM56 engine, um, the manufacturer is proud that the engines can stay twice as long on the wing without any replacement of the seals. So that can add to the problem. Oh, here I just want to show you, there are the, the bleed ducts. Um, and I'm not going into much more. There's also not much more to say. But these bleed ducts are a sink for all the dirty stuff. It can get stuck in there. And here, uh, the bleed air goes, we've seen that picture before. Um, into the packs, into the mixing unit, uh, finally into the cabin. And all these ducts uh, are prone of being contaminated. And we already know that there are, in the aircraft maintenance manual, 
uh, method described uh, how hopefully you can get the oil back out of things, like uh, there's this term pig burn. And then when it comes to the ducts, it sa says, yeah, you should have a rug and clean and maybe with some solvent. Um, but if you know, uh, understand um, how these things look like, then the question is, with what uh, rug do you want to get into these riser ducts, which are in between the windows, um, behind the panel? It's impossible. And then we've seen also, I also have a picture, they don't have a smooth surface, as ripples. Yeah? It's impossible. And also here, uh, heating the cabin is one method uh, to, go, to go about things. Um, but then I say to people, um, put a little bit of oil um, on your kitchen table and then use a hairdryer, uh, full power for half an hour, and then go over it. Is the oil gone? No, it's still there. Um, so it doesn't help. It doesn't help. And it would be good if people would, uh, I mean, engineers and manufacturers would stand up to that. I also know that in flight testing, if they have a problem there with some contamination, they want to sell a, a totally clean airplane and all parts which are contaminated are being replaced with new parts and then the airplane is sold. But this is something you cannot do in practice. And here's this procedure from the um, a manufacturer and I say it's not possible um, to clean the airplane. Now, uh, this is the part where I say we have so many detailed things and, and I think we are maybe losing the picture and it's very important to, to say uh, how do we know that there's this evidence that something is wrong? And uh, when air and oil comes from the engine, um, we have picture one uh, oil traces in uh, the bleed air ducts and then we have uh, this famous picture where uh, we have it in the air conditioning ducts and then it's being found in the recirculation filters and it's uh, found on cabin surfaces. Uh, in addition, the hydrocarbon concentration can be calculated as I've shown two years ago, and this is the equation to remind you. So there are so many things where, where you can say uh, something is wrong and there's no way to deny this. Now what I think is a little bit a problem that we are always showing the same pictures. I want to go to some graveyard, airplane graveyard, uh, where they dismantle airplanes and see if we can get tons of pictures of these ducts. Let's see if that works out. And why am I telling you about all these ducts and everything that gets stuck there? Um, this is a picture from an EASA report and um, we have to understand that there's primary and secondary cabin air contamination events. So primary and secondary cakes. Um, well, I only uh, added a little bit, but basically it's this EASA picture and the text here below is also from the EASA text. Um, so a primary event is that uh, the engine is working a little bit, is uh, tapped off, it may get deposited in the ducts and then we have tiny little traces, basically normal operation. Um, but still, as we uh, have learned, the low dose can affect um, crew and frequent flyers. Then we have some kind of event, something major happens, something is breaking. And here the depot is being filled, but at the same time maybe something comes out of the depot and we have a primary cake. Um, and then we can also have um, here what is called the secondary cake. Something happens, uh, not on the engine, but inside the ducts and uh, it can be mechanical stress, thermal stress, solvents. We've heard from Pal that they found that uh, the icing fluids is uh, solving uh, some of that and they uh, got some measurements there. This is uh, absolutely not understood today. Uh, it's kind of a speculation. It's kind of, ah, it makes sense. If I bring a little bit of knowledge together, then um, I worked on two-stroke engines and they have petrol and oil mixed and uh, so the oil is burned and then you have um, this uh, black, uh, but still a little bit uh, smeary thing um, in your exhaust. 
and it could be the very same thing here. And then why uh, can it produce fume? Then you talk with your chimney sweeper and the chimney sweeper tells you that you should not burn um, wood which is uh, a little bit wet because that makes also um, a coat uh, the inner part of your chimney and it can start to glow and the firefighters are not able to extinguish this. So it could be the very same mechanism uh, that uh, I know from two-stroke engines and from um, a chimney. Uh, what we've done here, um, we looked at the dynamics of uh, cabin air contamination <coughs> concentration and um, here you have all kinds of uh, sources of contaminants, not only from the bleed air. Um, and then, I mean, this is the easiest way of putting this differential equation together. And I only show one of these results where you have a certain uh, source, and this is then the uh, concentration in the cabin. And what you see is um, due to the fact that we have lots of air coming into the cabin after, you can say, um, 10, 20 minutes. Um, the concentration is gone. But um, if you have a constant source coming in, uh, as we've seen uh, in this Hawaiian case, then obviously um, the venting doesn't help. Uh, CS253009, as an Airbus engineer, X, uh, this was my daily bread and we have to limit risk, and we limit risk by uh, limiting the effect. Uh, this is here my, minor danger and so forth, uh, and looking at the probability, and we need to get the, the right uh, balance between that. Now, what my message is here, um, looking at the acceptable means of compliance, is that when people argue uh, that cakes, fume events, are uh, seldom, and um, it is meeting up with this, then I say, well, maybe it's the wrong concept because the things are, you have some parts, say a, uh, a pump, and you work it uh, for thousands of hours and eventually it will fail. All the technical parts will eventually fail. And this is why we have redundancy. We have mostly threefold redundancy. So if something fails and it's maintenance on condition, then everything is fine because we have two other means to get things done. But it is not, it is not made for engineering ignorance. If you know that something doesn't work because you have the wrong principle, then you cannot argue later on with 1309. So whenever someone comes and says, hey, 1309 and we are fine, no. It is for these pumps that fail after so and so many thousand hours. It is not because someone uh, was uh, ignoring common sense building the system. And SAE said clearly, uh, oil contamination can occur in using compressor bleed air from the main engines, and this may preclude its use for transport aircraft regardless of other reasons. And this is not an old document. They are looking every so many years uh, if they need to uh, modify this, uh, and there was no need. Now, the interesting thing is that when you have uh, an engine, you monitor the engine by looking at the oil. Also for the motorcycle, you have a, an oil plug with a magnet, and then you look at how many metal parts are um, stuck on this magnet. And the same thing, only more sophisticated, is taking place um, in the engine, where the engine oil is being looked at. So metal parts are in the oil, and this is totally normal. But the problem is, if the oil gets out, then also the metal parts uh, which are in the oil get out. And so micro and nanoparticles are leaving the engine together with the oil into the cabin, and finally, in human bodies. And this is... Um, here from, um, uh, from Dr. Gatti from Italy, um, where with an electron microscope, these pictures can be taken, and these are the tiny metal parts. And it's interesting is that uh, with an extra device here, 
they can also find out what the metals are. If it's uh, iron and chromium, it's from the bearings. And sometimes uh, there's also titanium, if there's a titanium case where the bearings are fitted. And if uh, the bearings get loose, then, I mean, normally they should stick in the bearing, but sometimes they start to rotate and then they scrap some uh, casing metal along with it. So to sum up, um, bearing seals leak, oil by design, uh, oil residues is found everywhere. Hydrocarbon concentration can be calculated. Uh, it is twofold in standard passenger aircraft compared to the Boeing 787. There is this dirty sock smell. We cannot use our nose as a sensor. The best reason is because you don't want to sense with your nose something that which is poisonous. Let it some other device do. Um, but, and, and this is also my message, uh, if you smell the dirty socks, no one tells you that, that this shouldn't be uh, reported uh, to the cockpit um, uh, or taken seriously in the cockpit. So our nose does something, but it shouldn't be used in the first place, and we know why it is not reliable, and there can be um, uh, oil in the cabin without sensing that. So there are chemicals, metals, that are within the body. We have this thinning effect, and industry is uh, arguing that this thinning effect uh, will wash everything out, but that's not the case. If you have uh, constant uh, contamination, then we see also this constant smoke. Um, and... Um, this bleed air design shouldn't be used. SAE says this, and certification rules are violated. And an aircraft, once contaminated with oil, cannot be cleaned. Too much effort is used to play things down. Uh, we need to go back to the cautionary proactive attitude, get back to aviation proven principle of um, caution and safety first. Thank you.